the expansion of the Roman Empire across Northern Europe is mirrored by that of Falodir. Between the 1st and the 5th century AD, Falodir appear to have been taken across Italy, Iberia and France, where the remains of Falodir, their bones, teeth and antlers, have been found in Roman period assemblages. However, there is some doubt about whether the remains represent evidence of living populations of deer. Some of the specimens, particularly antlers and artefacts made from Falodir bones, could have been transported as objects in their own right. This is especially the case as the Roman goddess of hunting Diana was, like Artemis before her, associated closely with fallow deer. Indeed, isolated fallow deer bones were recovered from a site associated with Diana in the Roman town of Augusta Rorica in Switzerland. So whilst these finds may reflect the northward spread of the cult of Diana, they may not represent the transportation of living fallow deer. One site where this issue can be explored further is at Fishbourne Roman Palace on the south coast of Britain. This site is the largest Roman villa north of the Alps, built in the 1st century AD, just a few decades after the Roman invasion of AD 43. The palace was sumptuous, decorated with fine paintings, intricate mosaics, and set in a beautiful landscape garden. To find out more about the palace and its significance to the Falodir story, Holly is visiting the site to meet its curator, Dr. Robert Simmons. The site was discovered in 1960 and is home to probably the best collection of in situ Roman mosaics in the country. So, Fishbourne, as you can see, was right at the edge of the Roman Empire, but it was drawing its resources from all over, all over the European Empire. You can see um, wine and oil coming up from the Mediterranean, pottery from southern Gaul, especially, especially um, Samian pottery, and Terra Nigra coming over from, from the Eastern Empire. So there was a huge trade in different goods coming in from Europe to Britain. But did that trade include living animals such as deer? During the most recent excavations of Fishbourne Palace, a number of fallow deer bones were identified, which has encouraged Holly to look back through the archive of earlier excavations to see if she can find some more bones for a scientific analysis. The collection's discovery centre is where all the animal bones and the other finds from the 1960s excavation at Fishbourne Roman Palace have been stored. For the last 50 years they have been carefully curated, so the collection can be examined again and again as new scientific techniques emerge. So this is just box one of... About 70. 70 boxes of bones from the palace? That's right, yeah. Okay, so what's the likelihood of some fallow deer in here? Well. Fallow deer crops up across the whole site as just, just as a sort of background signature. So, mm -hmm. so you know, we might get lucky. Have a look. We might get lucky. Were these live deer being imported, or just a trade in deer antler and bone? Yeah, there we go. Fallow deer, lovely. Great, thank you. Um, would you mind if I took this with me? I'd like to take a couple of samples maybe do some isotope work on it, have a look at the diet and management strategies. And I'd also like to take a bit from my colleague Karis, who would uh, look at the genetics of the herd. Through her reanalysis of the Fishbourne collection, Holly found over 20 falladier bones, including two jaw bones. The jaw bones are significant because the teeth they contain can be submitted to a form of scientific examination known as strontium isotope analysis. Because geology varies from region to region, Strontium values vary too. These strontium values transfer through the food chain, leaving a signature in animal bone and tooth. If an animal lives in one place for the whole of its life, its teeth will have the same strontium value as the local geology. But if an animal is transported over a long distance into a new area, its teeth will start to show a different value, indicating that it has moved. Holly took multiple samples from the teeth of the fishborn fallow deer so she could determine whether the animal moved during the time that its teeth were forming. As with humans, some teeth, like the first molar, form early in life, but others at the back of the jaw develop at an older age, like human wisdom teeth. Having taken these samples, Holly heads north to the British Geological Survey to talk to strontium isotope expert Professor Jane Evans about the results. So Jane, um, we've got some great results from Fishbourne here that you can see. One of the things that I found really fascinating is this one animal that we have, we call him Fishbourne 109, mm -hmm. 
We did his teeth and they show completely different results. One is significantly further away from what we would expect from Fishbourne. And then this one's kind of creeping down there. It's yeah. getting back towards that sort of average. What, what do you think this would mean? The values that you're getting here, the average value, mm -hmm. is pretty typical for an animal you'd expect grazing in this part of Britain. Mm -hmm. But as you say, this very high value here, mm -hmm. 711, above 711, is, is very unusual. Um, and it would be hard to accommodate it in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, there are parts of Britain that could generate a value like that, but they are some distance away. It's mostly these yellow areas. Mm -hmm. So this could potentially be a first generation import for it, these animals? It could. And as you say, the fact that the later tooth has a value closer to the local value would mm -hmm. suggest that it was brought in mm -hmm. and the value is moving towards the local value as it grazes in Fishbourne, perhaps. So it is a living import as well. It's not just pieces of this animal that are coming in. This is a, a living animal brought in by the Romans to the Fishbourne area. Yes, yes, it would, that would make sense, yes. So we have evidence for live deer being imported by the Romans into Britain. But why was this occurring? What significance did this animal have for the Romans? Luckily, we have an insight into this through the writings of Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella who wrote extensively on Roman agricultural practices. To learn more about Columella and what he reveals about Roman attitudes to the natural world, Holly pays a visit to Roman archaeologist Will Bowden. So Will, it looks like we've got really early fallow deer in Britain at Fishbourne Roman Palace. What are they doing there? Uh, well, it's, it's very interesting and very, very unusual that, they are, that they're there. The Roman attitude to the natural world is very much one of one of domination and you as a as a civilized roman what you're always trying to do when you're constructing the landscape of your villa the agricultural regimes that you're using you're bringing order and civilization to the to the chaos of the natural world columella talks about uh the imparking of creatures uh, for the uh, to delight the eyes of the proprietor of a villa and to uh, provide provide game and he talks then about types of deer uh, which may include fallow deer this is really right at the beginning of, of roman britain to have this going on in britain shows that whoever is living at fishbourne is extremely familiar uh, with the the ideologies of Rome itself. We can also see this uh, very much at Fishbourne with uh, the, uh, the imposition of gardens and this idea of, uh, of imparking, imparking animals. It's really, it's, it's completely unique uh, for, for Roman Britain. Fishbourne, of course, always uh, stands out. There is no, nothing else like Fishbourne mm -hmm. in, uh, in Roman Britain. <laughs> 